Hi, my name is Dawn Meek and I'm a primary teacher from Scotland. I'm 25 years old and diagnosed with classical Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I was diagnosed at age three. My brother and my dad both are diagnosed with EDS and that's sort of where my story begins. So as a child, I was pretty prone to slips, trips and falls, but unlike other children who would maybe get back up and start running around again, I was often splitting open, bruising easily, and I was hypermobile. Fortunately, or by divine intervention, my mum was a nurse, so she could see that by the age of one and two, things just weren't quite right, and accidents that were happening were maybe more severe than you would often expect. So for example, around the age of two and a half, I visited a &E on three occasions, and two of which I had to get stitches, and one of these was because my arm had come out of its socket and gone back in place itself. So at this point, my mum actually urged my dad to go to a doctor, since from a young age he displayed similar traits. So although a joiner and a really physically fit man, it was clear from the patchwork of poor wound healing and scars that there probably was some kind of connection there. And so after a skin biopsy, it was confirmed that my dad did indeed have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And then I subsequently was diagnosed at age three. So at the younger years, skin, um, as you can see on the PowerPoint, it was the most predominant role that I had as a younger child. Skin was the thing that made me feel as though I had Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, for the most part, in dealing with it, it was precaution, prevention, protection type measures. And you would often hear my family and friends say, watch, you don't fall, take your time. And there was often the joke that, you know, I was just a bit of a China doll who needed to be wrapped in bubble wrap. So from this, there are some kind of to-dos that when I was younger and skin played a big role in my upbringing, some of these worked well for me. So on the occasions that accidents did occur. Closing the wound quickly was quite a good measure. Um, and obviously with going to &E, sometimes you've got that hour to hour wait list. And if something was split minimally, luckily with my mum being a nurse, she would often steady strip herself. However, due to the papery fragile skin, often when I did split open, it wasn't just small, it would open up and it would expose the kind of fatty layer underneath. And I've actually been prone to do this as an adult You with just acrylic nails. So having long acrylic nails on and accidentally brushing against my hand has caused that kind of wound to open up and expose the fatty tissue layer. So in those instances, it was a case of going to the hospital and getting stitches. Um, and luckily my mum then could take care of the wound healing process at home. One particular occasion at around age five, I had to have a bigger surgery for an awkwardly shaped scar on my shin. Uh, a window opened up and it was quite difficult to close and I had to attend hospital and it was York Hills Children's Hospital in Glasgow um, for about 12 weeks to sort of maintain the healing process. And you can see from the picture on the PowerPoint there, I'm around the age of five. I was on a family holiday, so happy holiday for that. Um, and what had happened was I'd fell on a climbing frame and taking the front of my shin off the skin it was poor wound healing and things like that and again some of the do's are limit the movement and make sure that it's protected if if it has come into damage um, you can see from the picture that I was in a buggy I was age five and it was actually at the point where I was going to school so it all kind of happens at a difficult time but it then meant that I was given the support that I needed going to school because maybe if this hadn't happened, other people wouldn't have realised just from looking at me that I did have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So in one way, it was a good thing at the time that it happened. Um, another kind of maybe I don't was that I was offered a skin graft. However, the 12 weeks was a long time for the, the wound to heal. It was good because we didn't opt for the skin graft because my mum's worry was that maybe it would be two wound sites and that maybe wasn't as beneficial. So this quote um, plays like a really predominant part in my life. Um, so as I've said, that when I was a child, 
playing sports and riding bikes and things. It wasn't really something that I was able to do. However, it was really important that I was able to develop a sense of self and be known for something other than just having soft skin or being a China doll. Um, and although I did sit at the sidelines during sports day, I did have to excel in other areas. And for me, that's the creative arts, drama, poems, writing, painting, drawing, all those kinds of things. So the arts have heavily influenced not only who I am today as a teacher, but also in how I manage my Ellers danlos syndrome. So this quote is something that I share with my pupils at the start of every year. And I think it would also really be inspiring for any child, young person, adult who has an Ellers danlos diagnosis. And it's important to realise that you're not just a little boy or a little girl or an adult who has this condition. You do have talents and gifts to share with the world. And the quote is, the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of life is to give it away. And my gifts are the creative side of things and I give that away through my teaching. But also I'm beginning to see how it affects my other stand loss and how I can use some of my like public speaking, like what I'm doing just now, as a way to share my experiences and give my way of coping to others with the condition. Um, some of my influences that have kind of shaped the person I am today, it wasn't really until my teenage years that I began to deteriorate. And it was at this point that I was struggling to kind of manage it and using the expressive arts, it was definitely a way that I was able to express myself and get those feelings out. So as part of my Higher English Folio, I was asked to write a personal reflective story that was shaping my 16 year old self. And for my peers, that was definitely the day their brother or sister was born, when they won the football league, when they got a dog for Christmas. However, for me, there had been a cloud, something else going on, and that was my other stand loss, but the new and ranging symptoms, which did come as lower right abdominal pain, left-sided chest pain, palpitations, dislocations, things that your average teenager really wasn't having to cope with. And so for the first time, I wrote down my feelings and it was for my higher English essay and I titled it The China Doll. And you can see from the PowerPoint that the, the China Doll, she's wrapped in bubble wrap, she's protected. And there's obviously that thing where if she were to fall from a shelf, that the, the skin would be fragile and it would crack into lots of different pieces. So this was the first time that my teachers, parents and family had really heard how my condition had impacted me. Um, living with an invisible illness, it, it can be difficult for some people to see or even imagine how you're feeling or why you make the compromises that you choose to make. And for the first time, I had made the invisible visible and it did, it felt good. Um, the examiner obviously felt so as well because I was awarded an A-band one for my efforts. But the invisible is on the outside and lots of people don't see. And looking at me, especially in the, my teenage years and just now, I'm always dressed and ready and I don't think people maybe understand what else is going on and internally and emotionally when things aren't as good as they could be. So it was great to write things down. It gave me time to reflect and really think about my 16 year old self and where I was at. And on the screen, you can see a quote from my 16 year old thoughts. So I'd written that, I assume that I have lived my life in a bubble, but if the China doll is wrapped in bubble wrap and carefully placed in a box on a shelf, she will be as far from danger as possible. However, the danger with bubble wrap is that the China doll can't move. She can't see the world. And most importantly, she can't feel anything. So the bubble wrap has to be removed to ensure that the China's doll view of the world and her experience of it are not compromised. This China doll knows the risks and she's ready to take them. So this was me as a teenager thinking, how am I going to remove some of this bubble wrap, have the experiences, go to uni, go on nights out, have fun with my friends, and it was just about learning my limitations and beginning to go out there as an individual and as an adult and make those decisions that maybe my mum had made for me as a child that I would then decide, no, I can do that or I can't do that or that's not quite for me. Um, 
the next one is about the risk, taking the risks. So definitely at 25, I've removed some of the bubble wrap. Um, I've attended Glasgow University where I was awarded my BA in primary teaching. I've completed almost four years of teaching and I'm completing my master's in education alongside my teaching just now. I've learned how to drive and I'm currently thinking of moving into my own house independently sometime in the near future. Although there were definitely times that my EDS made it more difficult to achieve these things, it definitely makes me more appreciative and proud of what I have achieved. So currently, as you can see on the screen, I do have an array of symptoms which do impact my life at different, to different extents. And most issues reoccur in a chronic manner and sometimes they can be quite life limiting. Um, for example, I suffer from chest pain and I have done since I was about 16 or 17 and sometimes it can be a daily occurrence. Sometimes I get away with it for a few weeks not being there. I also have a mitral valve prolapse that was diagnosed the first time that we did an echo when I was around three or four. However, it's not changed over the years, which is definitely a good thing. And over the last five to seven years, um, I've had lots of irregular heart rate issues and been diagnosed with ventricular tachycardia and possibly POTS is probably in there somewhere as well. However, it's not been formally diagnosed. Um, I've suffered lots of different things, as you can see, recurrent lower right abdominal pain, GI issues, um, stomach burning irritation, the heart burn side of things, pain in my abdomen, um, abdominal pain that radiates to my back and my shoulder. I also have asthma and that can, it can make breathing kind of a difficult sometimes. And then there's the joint instability and the pain. And I've also developed a kind of an itchy, irritated kind of a skin feeling sometimes. Um, and that can sometimes be accompanied with like a rash. And then there's a soft, stretchy skin that splits open for wound healing that I've had and been coping with for quite some time. So you can see that growing up, things all add up and things don't really go away. It's more, they more add up. But there is definitely ways of managing my symptoms. So from the age of three, I attended York Hill Children's Hospital in Glasgow, and that was following a diagnosis that I was sent there. There wasn't a specialist and somebody just volunteered really to take over my, my condition and observe me and see what kind of a path that they could send me down. And it was a holistic approach where I was sent to cardiology, dietary, the different areas that needed managed and if there was an issue, I was able to call up and say, I'm having this. What could we do about it? And then I could be referred to the right department. However, at the age of 16 to 18, when the symptoms that I've just discussed started to impact me a lot more, it was also at the point where there was a transition from children's to adult medicine. And since leaving York Hill, although a few people, I've seen a few people once or twice, no one's actually overseen my care. Um, I know there isn't specialist in things, but having someone that was a point of contact definitely was a really beneficial thing growing up as a child. And this was difficult because it was the point where I needed management of my symptoms. Things were getting harder to manage, new symptoms were occurring. And it was also at the point in my life where I was sitting my hires, I was looking to go to university and really starting my adult life and how I was going to manage my symptoms. And I would say it was def definitely a test in time at that point. Currently, um, I'm seen under cardiology, but I re receive a yearly echo and I'm on bisoprol to control heart rate and palpitations. However, I wouldn't say that it's managed particularly great and there's definitely times where it can be quite debilitating. Um, I've been referred back to genetics because the doctor's kind of at a point where it's, diff it's difficult to know where to go and given that there aren't specialists nearby and things like that. Um, so I've been sent to genetics. However, there's a 40 week, week, wait, week, a 40 week waiting list for that. Um, I've been talking to my GP and we've been referring me forward for gastro. However, all of these different symptoms, one, one week I might have a particular symptom, the next week I might have something else. And I often say that one month, what feels like the worst possible symptom is often next month's, month's wish list. And what I mean by that is 
when I've got a symptom, it feels like the worst thing. But then when that symptom goes away and another one of my symptoms comes, I think, oh, I wish it was what I had before. You know, it it's just a difficult thing. Um, recently I was, I visited the pain management clinic. This, it wasn't particularly helpful overall, given that I don't know how compassionate the doctor was around my EDS symptoms. Um, things like the pain can be in your head and different things that, as we know, people who have an EDS diagnosis don't really need to hear. However, she agreed to refer me to accept and this gives you strategies to cope with chronic conditions and pain. So I'm hopeful for that and it will be great to see how, what, like, what kind of things they advise and just to see how it, even talking about it might be a good thing. So again, the doctor then comes around as the, the main point of contact and this can be a frustrating process. You know, I often feel like a nuisance and sometimes the doctors will admit that they manage to, to manage the wide and complex nature of my symptoms. Most symptoms don't really have a clear answer and you're left feeling that there's not really anywhere to turn to. Yet they persist and they're still there and you, you have to deal with them and that can then become a mentally draining process. For me, I think it's important that doctors realise what rides on an appointment for someone with Ehlers-Danlos. I know for me, I spend a lot of time thinking, how will I explain this to my doctor? And imagining the kind of resolutions that might come of an appointment, yet sometimes we can feel dismissed. And for patients with Ehlers-Danlos, that is a real strong fight to be diagnosed. And that path is slowly getting better for a lot of people. However, for me, being diagnosed at age three, I then felt that I always had Ehlers-Danlos. I never had that moment where everything fell into place and I thought, oh, this is why I've been feeling this way. So I've always known I've had it and therefore I feel I'm in that kind of a position of we're diagnosed, but what else can we be given to manage these symptoms? And a common feeling for adults after an EDS diagnosis is that there isn't many places to turn to and from this there is the big need to be heard and if anything comes out of presenting this I think this is one of the most important parts um, as often can be the case as I said in the doctor's office patients can feel unheard dismissed or labelled and things have been particularly bad this year and in the summer I took to Facebook to share a poem that I had written about my experience with EDS and classical Ehlers-Danlos which I'm diagnosed with and this was during pain awareness month so it was it felt like a good time to share my poem and although sharing my poem didn't take the pain away it certainly opened up conversation and that was with family, friends and then most importantly others dealing with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So sharing my story has been uplifting and it's been an experience that's definitely helped me come to terms with my Ehlers-Danlos and hearing from people who read that and thought that's exactly how I'm feeling, that's that's me. It was so good to see that other people were feeling the same way and I definitely felt heard. And so to end my talk, I really would like to finish up by sharing my poem in the hopes that it will help someone. It's my way of sharing my gift and passing it on and I hope that someone in a similar position to myself may think, that's me and it might give them a bit of comfort and it definitely concludes my thoughts everything that I've said before the younger years the skin the growing up how things have become more difficult it's all sort of explained within the poem so I'll just go ahead and read it out meet Ehlers-Danlos syndrome a rare connective tissue disease an unwanted friend bearing gifts of soft skin and dislocated knees it comes to the door more often than not when you'd rather spend time on some other thought. Sometimes it's a knock, sometimes it's a chap. Yet in reality, it's often a debilitating stab, jag or snap. Each person who suffers has their own familiar friend. Deep, sharp or constant, it sends us round the bend. Yet no matter how often you open the door, the disease returns looking to confide once more. When our visible friends ask us where we've been, 
it's difficult to explain the monster that we've seen. But invisible to all, except those at your friends, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome can be a difficult concept to comprehend. Genetically predisposed and diagnosed by age three, that's when Ehlers-Danlos first came to visit me. My story started as a China doll, protected from the world in case of slips, trips and fall. As an innocent child, you take it all in the chin. Literally and metaphorically speaking, let that sink in. Yet the pain only visited once or twice a year and I brushed it off whilst my parents lived in fear. It took me some time before I began to understand the complex and stubborn nature of the invisible illness firsthand. By age 17, it came to a head. Chronic chest pain, palpitations and days spent in bed. Yet I continued on, never looking in the eye, the invisible disease that wouldn't comply. Five hires, a car and a teaching degree sat in stark contrast to chronic pain and a dislocated knee. Now age 25, it's hard to ignore the invisible illness chapping at the door. Looking ahead, it's important to start inviting my invisible friend in for a heart to heart. For it's always been there and there it will be. Make peace with your monster like my monster and me. Now next time you hear that familiar chap at the door, open it up, make peace and restore. And remind yourself that your monster has friends, other EDS patients on whom you can depend. Thank you.